Well, hello and good morning. Welcome back. Happy Sunday. Weeks just seem to be kind of flying by a little bit, although many of us are probably locked in our homes or at least not doing as much as we're used to. It just seems like to me that the weeks are still going by pretty fast. I don't know. Maybe I'm just staying busy uh, writing the devotionals. I hope you're enjoying those if you're receiving those. And then, uh, you know, just doing the basic things you do around the house and catching up on some projects. So, uh, but it's really good to be with you this morning. And I hope and pray that this morning we will sense the presence of God and that we'll be able to celebrate together God's goodness to us. So before we begin, uh, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer and then we're gonna jump into God's word together today. Father God, we thank you again for your love for us and your mercy and your goodness. Father God, we lift up uh, all the lives in, in, in our society today that are being affected by this coronavirus, Lord. And we just pray, God, that you'll just touch people in very special ways, whether they're small business owners or people that are out of work because of it or people that are just struggling uh, in, in a variety of different ways, emotionally, financially, uh, maybe socially, Lord. And I just pray, God that uh, we'll rest in you during this time and we'll trust in you. Father God, again, thank you for this opportunity of getting together today, and we pray that you'll be glorified and blessed by everything that is said and done. In your name we pray these things. Amen. So, I thought today we would jump into a very familiar passage of Scripture, and that's Psalm 23. And before we jump into Psalm 23, I just want to wanna just throw out a couple of different ideas uh, for you this time and, and kind of give you what general feel I have for Psalm 23 and then we're just going to study the psalm and, and see what we can discover out of Psalm 23 today. The first thing I wanted to mention is is that it's, it's very important the perspective that we take when we're reading through Psalm 23. I would like us to take a perspective of being the sheep or being the traveler that's on a journey um, instead of looking at just the, the host that hosted the traveler or, or just simply looking at the shepherd who shepherded the sheep, I, I want to put ourselves in a subservient role uh, in that particular capacity. In other words, I, I want to look at this passage of scripture as if we're the sheep, which we are, and as if we're the traveler in which we are, and, uh, and see where that takes us in light of our study of scripture today. Also, I wanted to mention to you that this passage of scripture was probably written by David later on in his life. Um, and the reason I say that is, is because as he describes the struggles that he's walking through and the difficulties he's having shepherding, um, not just the sheep, but the sheep of Israel as well. Um, I think that can be implied in this passage. Um, it, it definitely shows me that uh, he's definitely later on in years and, and he's kind of just lamenting about some of the things that he's experiencing uh, over the years of his ministry. And the other thing that I, the last thing I wanted to just mention to you is, is I'm of the kind of the, the, the camp that, that takes Psalm 23 and divides it into two different types of uh, application, at least two different types of um, presentation if you want to call it that. So I just wanted to kind of mention those things before we get, jump into Psalm 23. But with that being said, I hope you have your Bibles with you today. And uh, if you could open them to Psalm 23, we're going to pretty much camp out here today. Um, we will be looking at some other passages of Scripture, but our primary text today is going to be Psalm 23. So let's go ahead and, and pick up at Psalm 23, beginning at verse 1. Psalm 23 Beginning at verse 1, it says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. The Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not be in want. And I want to talk about this verse in a variety of different ways today. First of all, it says the Lord. And who is the Lord here? If you notice, if you look in your Bibles again, the Lord is all caps. L-O-R-D, all caps. And it comes from the word Yahweh, Yahweh, which we get the concept of the great I am, I am. In other words, I am the self-existent one. And also, if you know Jewish history, you know that the term Yahweh was, a, was probably the most sacred word that they could use of their God. And uh, it was one of those words that, that literally kind of 
uh, elevated the title of God to a point where, where you couldn't even publicly say it out loud. And it's this, I am, this Lord that we're going to look at today. And the first thing we find out about this Lord, Yahweh, which we believe, honestly, is Jesus before he became flesh. This Yahweh, this Lord, is David's personal shepherd. Is David's personal shepherd. Look what it says again. The Lord is what? My personal shepherd. Now, I want to think about that for a moment. Is God your personal God? He sure is. Is Jesus your personal Savior? Absolutely. Is the Holy Spirit your personal guide? Most definitely. I think sometimes we forget that fact. We forget the fact that, that Jesus is our personal Savior. That Jesus is our personal Lord. That God is our personal Father. That the Holy Spirit is our personal protector and our personal guide. And, and, and David is, is wrapping his mind around that. He, he's, he's wrapping his mind around the truth that this God, this Lord, this Yahweh, that is, is the loftiest title that I could give my God, this God, this pre-incarnate Christ, Christ before he became flesh, is my personal shepherd. Now, I told you I want to look at this from the perspective of the sheep. So what do we know about sheep? What do you know about sheep? First of all, sheep probably aren't the smartest animal on the farm, right? They're, they're not probably the brightest animal around. Uh, first off, they are easy prey. They, they have no inclination of how to fight back, of how to defend themselves. And, and coupled with that is they tend to be wanderers. So they tend to just wander off like everything's peachy cream. And uh, they make themselves even more vulnerable. And so the shepherd has to keep a really good eye on them because they have a tendency of, of kind of being a, a drifter. And, and isn't that true of us today? I mean, we can drift into all different types of things, can't we? I mean, we can drift here with our theology. We can drift here with our life. We tend to be wanderers when it comes to that. And, and the enemy sees us as very vulnerable to be honest with you. And so we need a shepherd. We need a shepherd that can protect us. And, and that's one of the elements that go along in this passage. If, if you read it again, it says, the Lord is my shepherd, my personal shepherd. So, so he's, he's David's personal protector and he's our personal protector. But as we study further, we also know that what a shepherd does for the sheep is he provides for the sheep, right? He provides protection for the sheep, yes, but he provides food for the sheep. He provides a place for the sheep to rest. So we see the shepherd, we see God as our protector. We see him as our provider, but, but it, goes, it goes further than that. Look, look, at this shep look at this word again. It says, the Lord is my shepherd. That means he is what? He is David's caregiver. He is David's caregiver. You know, sometimes we just have to be someone's caregiver, right? When, when someone may be distraught over something or, or, or someone may be injured or someone may be sick, we have to just kind of step alongside of them and, and we have to take care of them and we have to watch over them. And, and that means doing whatever is necessary, whatever they need at that particular moment. And that's what David is experiencing here. My, my guess would be by, by reading Psalm 23 that David is going through some difficult times, don't you think? And he's walking through the valley of the shadow of death. I mean, there's darkness that surrounds him. And, and, and he's pretty distraught at times, as we can see, not just in this passage, but as we read other Psalms of David. There are times of great distress in David's life. And so what he needed from his shepherd was he needed a caregiver, someone that could kind of step up to the plate when, when he was too, too weak to swing the bat. So, someone that could carry him when, when he was really too weak to fight the battles. Someone that would be his shield and his rampart. Someone that would feed him when he was hungry. 
But this concept of shepherd goes even one step further. This concept of shepherd literally means a king, a king, someone who would shepherd as a king. I, I want to show you something here. I, I want you to keep your finger here in Psalm 23, but I want you to turn, if you would, to the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 34. I, I want to show you something out of the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 34. Now, I want you to keep in mind that, that uh, God is, is the shepherd of David. And David was also the shepherd of the Israelites. And the Israelites needed a shepherd. They needed someone that would protect them. They needed someone that would guide them. They needed someone that would be their caregiver. They needed someone who could, you know, in a sense, provide for their needs. And they had a lot of shepherds. And some of them weren't very good. Some of them just kind of didn't meet up to the litmus test, you know. And, and, and God addresses that in Ezekiel chapter 34. And, and I, want, I want to read this with you, okay? So can you, you follow along and, and read this passage of Scripture with me? And, and you'll see where we're going once we kind of start getting into this passage. Ezekiel chapter 34, beginning at verse 1. The word of the Lord came to me. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Woe to the shepherds of Israel who only take care of themselves. Should not shepherds take care of the flock? Verse 3. You eat the curds, clothe yourselves with the wool, and slaughter the choice animals, but you do not take care of the flock. You have not strengthened the weak or healed the sick or bound up the injured. You have not brought back the strays or searched for the lost. You have ruled them harshly and brutally. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And when they were scattered, they became food for all the wild animals. My sheep wandered over all the mountains and on every high hill. They were scattered over the whole earth and no one searched or looked for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, because my flock lacks a shepherd and so has been plundered and so has become food for all the wild animals. And because my shepherds did not search for my flock, but cared for themselves rather than my flock. Therefore, O shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. I am against the shepherds and will hold them accountable for my flock. I will remove them from tending the flock so that the shepherds can no longer feed themselves. I will rescue my flock from their mouths, and I will no longer be food for them. For this is what the Sovereign Lord says, verse 11 now, I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. As a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so I will look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. And I will bring them out from the nations and gather them from the countries and I will bring them into their own land. Now go back to Psalm 23. What is God saying here through the prophet Ezekiel? He's saying, listen, there are those who have tried to shepherd you, but they did it for self-glory and self-gain. They weren't doing it to protect you. They were doing it to protect themselves. They weren't shepherding you to provide for you. They were shepherding you to provide for themselves. They were a king in a sense unto themselves. They were using the position of authority to pad their own wallets. I have no place for a shepherd like that. And so he says to us as his sheep through David in Psalm 23, I will be your personal shepherd and I will promise to be your king and I will promise to have your best interest in mind and I will promise to protect you and I will promise to provide for you and I will promise to be your caregiver. 
That is my personal promise to you. Wow. Now let's read on. Picking up at verse 2. It says, This shepherd, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He makes me lie down. He gives me rest. We all need rest, don't we, from the toil of life, from the hardship of life. Isn't there times where we just need a place to rest? You know, the, the, the sheep would often be, be brought into their pen to rest because that, that's where they could find protection. That's where the shepherd knew they wouldn't wander off. What is the pen in which Christ Jesus brings us into? Where does he bring his fold? Where does he bring his sheep? He brings them into the presence of the almighty king. And he guards them there. And he protects them there. What does it feel like to be able to lay down and get a good night's sleep knowing that you're well protected? Knowing that no harm will come your way? Knowing that you're in a safe place? Have you ever stayed awake all night because you didn't feel like you were in a safe place? Maybe you're in a relationship that wasn't safe and you were worried about that. Or maybe your mind was racing a million miles an hour because of a great big meeting that you had the next morning that you were concerned about. Or because you had just had a test at the doctor and you were awaiting a phone call and you just, you just couldn't sleep and you just couldn't get any rest. What the great shepherd promises us is if we reside in him, if we place our trust in him, in him we find, will find shelter. In him we will find rest. He provides a safe haven for us to rest in. The relationship that we have with our personal shepherd is a relationship of rest, a relationship of provision, a relationship of protection, a relationship of care. What else does it say? It says, not only does he lead us beside still waters. Now, think about that for a moment. One thing we know about sheep is they couldn't swim very well. Because basically, they would get in the water and with all of that wool, they would just be, become a sponge. I mean, they would soak up all the water and they would literally sink and they would drown themselves. And so they became fearful of this running stream or this running river. So the shepherd wouldn't take them by the running river. He would take them by what? A stilled stream where they could find refreshment, where they could get a drink without the fear of being injured or hurt or dying. That's where we find ourselves today when we rest in God's presence. It is a safe place. It is a still place. It is a still stream where we can find rest and refreshment in the quietness of his presence. Even when it's not quiet around us, even when havoc is breaking out around us, within the very lap of Christ, we can find a quiet rest as his sheep and as he shepherds us. It goes on in verse 3 to say this. He restores my soul. He restores my soul. Sometimes our soul just needs restoration, doesn't it? Our soul gets weary. Our soul gets tired. I think sometimes our soul gets tired because there's so much garbage out there that, that vies for a position within our soul, right? And, and there's things that vie for a position and there's power struggles that vie for a position and there's certain pleasures in this world that vie for a position. And, and sometimes we try to feed our soul with these things. And, and it, it's, just, it's just like a, a little baby. If, 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 if you don't watch what you feed a baby, then what happens? They get an upset stomach, right? 
I mean, we have a little puppy. You guys know that. And, and we have to be very careful what we let him eat. You know, we, we, we're very careful at what, what, you know, treats we give him as far as what, what we buy. And we make sure they're, they're puppy prepared. And, and we're very careful, you know, that he doesn't eat something when he's outside because puppies eat anything when they're outside, right? Because they get a sick tummy because they're feeding themselves with whatever they can find. And I think sometimes in life, that's how our souls get, you know, uh, Satan is out there just lying to us and, and, and telling us things that we need to feed our soul with. And, uh, you know, there's only good things to feed our soul with. And those good things come from the Lord. And so he says, sometimes your soul just needs restoration. And I'm, I'm here as your shepherd to, to restore your soul. To, to restore your soul, to, to bring it back to health again. If you'll just turn it over to me and, 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 and trust in me. Trust in me to provide for you. Trust in, in me to, to meet your needs. Now pick up at verse 3. He guides me in paths of righteousness. In other words, he, he, he guides me down the right path. How many times have you and I, you know, taken the wrong road? You know, have you ever been on vacation and you've taken the wrong road and, and maybe you've gotten into an area of town where you're like, oh, I'm, I'm not feeling real safe here. I, I think I need to kind of maneuver to another part of town again. Or, or have, have, have you ever made a decision that you thought, you know what, I, I'm just going to go for it. I'm going to make this decision. And, and in your gut, you're like, I don't think this is probably a good thing. But now that I've already committed to it, I'm just going to, I'm going to go for it and and God is trying to lead you down the right path, but you're kind of, you know, doing your own thing, which is the wrong path, instead of trusting him. What God says is, listen, as the shepherd, I am your guide. I'm your guide. And if the sheep listen to my voice, I will guide you down the right path. I, I, I will make your plans prosper. If, you, if you'll make your plans under my guidance, but, but if you just go hilly-nilly and you just do your own thing without any thought to anybody else or any thought to what I would have for you, then there's a good possibility your plans aren't going to work out. And, and, and who knows where that's going to lead you. So when you're on the wrong path, I'll, I'll guide you back to the right path. And when you're on the right path, I'll try to, I'll try to give you guidance to keep you on the right path. That, that's what he's saying here. Th that's what the shepherd does. What's a sheep's responsibility? To listen to the guidance, right? To listen to the instruction. To, to say, God, you know, wh whatever you want me to do, I'm willing to do. Just, 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 just teach me and show me, point me in the right direction. I'm willing to follow your guidance. Are, are you willing to do that today? Or, or, or you just kind of have your own path in mind and you just say, you know, I'm just going to do as I want to do. Well, good luck with that. That's all I can say. Good luck with that. I will tell you one thing, God will never lead you down the wrong path if you're willing to follow his guidance. What else does it say? He does all of this, the last part of verse three, for his name's sake. What does that mean? What, what really is being said here is, listen guys, as your shepherd, I'm putting my reputation on the line. I'm telling you everything I'm going to do for you. I'm going to bring you protection. I'm going to provide for your needs. I'm going to keep you on the right path. I'm going to be your caregiver. I'm going to be your leader. I'm going to be your king. I'm going to be a good shepherd to you. And if that doesn't happen, if for some reason, for instance, you know, I don't provide the care that I promised, or I don't provide the food that I promised, or I direct you down the wrong path, or I'm not the king that I promised to be. If somehow I fail you, that's my reputation that's on the line. So I'm putting my reputation as the, on the line as the great I am, as Yahweh, as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I'm giving you my word and my reputation and my character is on the line that I'm going to do exactly what I told you I'm going to do. Or else I'm not worthy to be followed. I'm not worthy to be your shepherd. I'm not worthy to be your king. 
You see what he's saying here? That's pretty exciting, isn't it? It's exciting to me to think that God is willing to say, listen, my character supersedes any attack that you're going to experience, anything you're going to go through. And I can promise you that regardless of where you find yourself, that I will be there for you and I will shepherd you through it. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And he did that over and over again. And he made those promises over and over again to the nation of Israel. In fact, turn with me to the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 2. I want to show you something here. Deuteronomy chapter 2. Deuteronomy chapter 2. I, I want you to look at Deuteronomy chapter 2 verse 7. Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 7. What does it say? Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 7. The Lord your God has blessed you. Now, now they, he's speaking to the Israelites here, right? Uh, through Moses, and he's talking to them as they're wandering in the wilderness, as they're wandering in the desert. And, and, and here's, here's the words that, that Moses speaks to them. He says this, he says, the Lord your God has blessed you in all the work of your hands. He has watched over your journey through the vast desert. These 40 years, the Lord your God has been with you and you have lacked nothing. You haven't lacked anything. All of that time, the Lord your God has been with you. His reputation was on the line and he didn't let the Israelites down. They didn't follow him, right? They didn't follow his lead a lot of the times, but he was always there with them. He was carrying out his role, carrying out his part, carrying out his promise to never leave them or forsake them. Now let's look a little bit further. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8, I want to pick up at verse 7. Deuteronomy chapter 8, picking up at verse 7. It says this, For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with streams and pools of water, with springs flowing in the valleys and hills, a land with wheat and barley, vines and fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil and honey, a land where bread will not be scarce and you will lack nothing a land where the rocks, the iron, and you can dig copper out of the hills. Verse 10, when you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land that he has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, and his decrees that I am giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud and you'll forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. What is he saying? He's saying, I want you to remember that when you're walking through the desert, when you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, that I am with you. My character demands that I stay with you. My word and my promise demands that I be your comfort, that I be your guide, that I be your caregiver, that I be your provider. But when you exit that valley on the other end, when you come out of that trial, that tribulation, that hardship, I want you to remember who brought you through it. And I want you to worship the one who brought you through it. If not, you're going to start patting yourself on the back and forget your Lord and think that it's all about you and what you've done. How many times are we guilty of that? When we have success in a, an investment, when we have success in a business, when, when we're able to do certain things because we've quote unquote worked hard all our life for those things. And then we, we rest in those things, believing this is something we had done, that we had provided. 
the success of a church, look what we did. The success of a business, look what I did. The success of kids that are following after the Lord, look what we were able to do as parents. You know, whatever the case might be. And then what happens is, is instead of worshiping the Lord, we worship ourselves. But isn't it interesting? When things don't work out, who do we blame? <laughs> Anyone but ourselves. Blame our spouse, blame God. Isn't that funny how it works? Well, back in Psalm 23, what he's saying is, listen, based on my reputation, I promise to be with you. And therefore, what is the response of the sheep? What is the response of the sheep? Look at the rest of verse 4. It says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I have no reason to fear any evil. Because why? God is with me. Now I want you to notice something here because I think this is interesting. Do you notice how the pronoun has changed? How it's become more personal? Like for instance, in, in verse 1, he says, The Lord is my shepherd. He makes me lie down. He leads me. He guides me. The word he. And then he changes it to even a more personal pronoun. And what is it? You. You will do this for me. You will do that for me. Why? Because he's understanding more the intimacy of the relationship that he has with the shepherd. The sheep are falling in love with the shepherd. Are believing in the shepherd. And so instead of the shepherd just being a he. It's now a you. I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and staff, instruments of protection, right? The rod being an instrument of protection from any predator that might attack the sheep. The staff being almost like an element to rescue or to guide, to grab a sheep, to, to get it back on the right path, right? I will fear no evil because you are with me. Your rod and your staff they comfort me. What does it feel like to be a sheep under such a great shepherd? I hope you're amazed by that. I hope you're, 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 you're experiencing incredible satisfaction by knowing that we serve a God who loves us enough to protect us personally, to provide for us personally, to be our caregiver personally, to be our personal king, our personal shield, our personal refuge, who gives us a personal rest in him, who feeds us a personal feast. Take a look at the second part, where here we see in verse 5, Jesus as a hospitable host. Track along with me here and, and see what it says in verse 5. You prepare a table before me, in the presence of my enemies. So what is he talking about here? Well, here's a scenario. Now we get a picture of someone that's on travel and they're traveling through a land that they don't know well. And the traveler uh, happens to be walking along, probably in a foreign country, foreign land. And uh, he, he comes up to uh, a house where uh, he knocks on the door perhaps and someone greets him and, and welcomes him in. And when someone would welcome you in as a traveler and they would begin to put food on the table for you, it meant more than just, hey, here's some food, have a great day. They became your host. And they were not only offering you food, they were offering you protection from your enemies or anything out there that could possibly cause harm to you. Starvation, thievery, you name it. Now pick up at verse 5. The host prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Not only that, not only do you lay a huge spread on the table, and by the way, I don't think they're leftovers. They're probably the best meal that the, the host could put on the table. I mean, God doesn't give us leftovers, does he? He gives us the best. He gives us absolutely the best. And then it says, you anoint my head with oil. What was that a sign? That was a sign of royalty almost. A sign of saying, you're an honored guest. 
I am so glad that you stopped by and knocked on my door. It's an honor to be able to serve you. Now think about that. A humble traveler, right? Just looking for a kind of a place to find some rest, some solitude, knocks on a door, and not only is he welcomed in, he's given the, the basically the fatted calf, the best meal that the host can provide, and then the host anoints him with a very expensive oil over his head saying, not only are you my guest, but, but you're, you're, you're the, one of the most special guests I've ever had in my home. Now I want you to look at that in relationship to God, our Father and Jesus Christ. We were wandering, right? We were lost. We were travelers. And we, we knocked on the door. And the door is open for us. And he prepared a great feast and we ate with him and he ate with us. It was a great meal. He anointed us in a sense with oil saying, you are special to me. You are one of the most significant guests that I've ever had at my table. And not only that, now I want you to be part of my family. I want you to be part of my family. Isn't that amazing? Absolutely amazing. Let's read on now. Surely goodness, verse 6, and love will follow me. Think about that now. What is goodness and love? They're characteristics of what? The incredible host for the traveler. They're characteristics of an incredible shepherd that shepherds us. Surely God. Surely Jesus Christ, surely the Holy Spirit will follow us, will follow me. The goodness of God, the love of God will follow me. For how long? All the days of my life on this planet. There won't be a day where I will not have a shepherd shepherding me. There won't be a day where I will not have a host offering me a full meal celebration of my presence, protection from my enemies, care for my needs. That will happen from Jesus Christ, my Lord and my Savior, for the rest of my life. What else does it say? And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now listen, listen to this. The temple wasn't yet built. I don't believe that this is talking about a physical structure. I don't even necessarily believe this is talking about heaven. Although the forever part is definitely eternal. But I think it's much greater than that and much bigger than that. I think what it's talking about is never escaping the presence of God. That's what heaven is, isn't it? Heaven is never escaping the presence of God. Everything else is fluff in comparison to being in the very presence of God and being face to face with our Lord and Savior. Right? I mean, yeah, we're going to walk on streets of gold. Yeah, there's not going to be any more tears. There's not going to be any more ailments, you know. Uh, but that's not the, that, that's kind of like not the major thing, is it? What's the major point of heaven? Having a face-to-face -face encounter with God forever. Now, now read this passage again in light of that. Surely goodness and love will follow me. God and his goodness and his love will follow me. Every single day for the rest of my life on this planet. And from this point on, I am going to dwell in the very presence, having a face-to-face -face encounter with my God, not just on this planet, but the promises forever. What a mighty God we serve. If he walks before us, if we follow his lead, we can make it through any virus. We can make it through any epidemic. 
because the shepherd is with us. His rod and his staff, they comfort us. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the study of your word today, and we thank you for your goodness and your grace. God, we just pray that as we rest in you, that we will trust you as our good shepherd, and Lord, we will trust you as our superior host to be our ever-abiding king, our provider, our protector, and our caregiver. In your name we pray these things. Amen. Have a great week. We'll see you again next week. Take care. God bless.